Hey everybody, Dr. Dan here, and this week we are in week 10, which is chapter 9, I think, let me be sure. Um, yeah, and uh, this the title of this chapter is called The Rise of the South, 1815 to 1860. Now, this book's a little bit different in the way that it handles these chapters. So, this time period between 1815 and 1860 is what we refer to as the antebellum era. And antebellum means before the war. So it's referring to before the Civil War. And of course, 1860 is when the Civil War starts. So um, the book is, is laid out nicely because actually it has four chapters that are covering the same time frame. And I think what that is saying is that there were really uh, three distinct regions of the U.S. and it's useful to study their histories differently uh, or separate. Otherwise, it's it's confusing. So uh, this week, we're the rise of the South, and then next week, we're the restless North, and then 11 is the contested West, and you know, you probably know the story by now, but in case you don't, this this idea that the country is expanding West after the Louisiana Purchase, you know, the big question is, is slavery going to go West or not? Is slavery going to be legal in new Western states uh, or not? So this idea of um, sectional debates or sectionalism, um, um, you know, that's really important to these next three chapters. So and, and that's going to cause all kinds of conflict. So, you know, what we learn about in this chapter, and I'm trying to get to my notes, but I'm hopelessly lost. So just bear with me. Oh, jeez. Sorry about that, guys. Anyway, so what we're doing in this chapter is we're looking at the South as a separate entity. And we're looking at the South, um, you know, prior to the Civil War between 1815 and 1860. And, and so what, you know, what's similar about the South and the North? Well, you know, distribution of wealth during that period of time was, was similar. There was a lot of profitable manufacturing in the North, but there was also a lot of profitable slavery in the South. So, you know, the big answer when you're thinking about, okay, were there more similarities or dissimilarities between the North and the South? There were far more dissimilarities, but the similarities did exist in, you know, there being two social classes, basically people that had money and people that didn't have money. So those two things are in common, but the South didn't have any real manufacturing at all. As far as like steel mills, iron mills, manufacturing, there were some textile mills for sure, but not heavy manufacturing like in the North. And one of the reasons for that is that the South was based on this agricultural plantation, rural life. And because of that, uh, because they were agrarian, a manufacturing industry never really grew, and and also because they were agrarian, as far as um, social reform, education, uh, public schools, that sort of thing, there wasn't a lot of that in the South before the Civil War because there weren't really any big cities. Most of the southern cities, other than the East Coast, were spread out and were smaller villages. So, you know, now you have Birmingham, Alabama, for example, which is huge, but, but that took a while. So it, it wasn't as urban as the North overall. There was less population density, and so the South was really distinctively different in its society because if you were a poor white or a yeoman farmer, they, they talk about yeoman farmers in these books, which are just farmers out trying to make a living. Um, for those people, you know, life wasn't great. There wasn't a lot to do other than church. But, you know, the other classes in the South, of course, were slaves, African slaves, for the most part. Uh, there were Native Americans in the South at this time, so we need to talk about that because that's a sad story. And then there were also the plantation owners that had all of this money and led this um, um, very... Um, um, you know, almost like a, a monarchy, you know, led this really elaborate life with elaborate customs and uh, where, you know, the man, the plantation owner was, you know, in charge of everything. Um, and we'll talk more about that as we get into it. But just understand there's these distinctive uh, classes in the South and a lot of it is based on slavery and a lot of it's based on uh, expansion because when the country opened up for westward expansion after the Louisiana Purchase, it's the Southerners who wanted to go west first. So think about the Carolinas, think about Georgia, 
Um, think about Tennessee, a little bit of Kentucky, you know, this whole idea of pushing westward into what is now um, Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, that was all good cotton growing uh, country. So uh, slaveholders and plantation owners knew, hey, if we can go acquire land in the west, we're going to expand our holdings, we're going to take all these slaves with us, and we're going to get really rich. So that's, you know, sort of the thing. Um, the book talks about also uh, justifications for slavery. So as part of this Southern culture, it talks about justification for slavery. And, and um, that's, you know, it, it's common sense stuff. So the justification for slavery was that uh, Southerners thought that that was just the natural state of people of color, that they were, they should be enslaved. They said that slavery was in the Bible, so it was cool. Um, they claimed that slaves wouldn't be able to take care of themselves on their own. So as slave owners, we were really taking care of people who were hopeless on their own. And also the big argument is that, or was, that um, slaves are property because they're bought and, bought and sold. And so therefore, um, it's okay. I can do whatever I want with my property. So that was another justification for slavery. There's a question about that on the quiz, uh, but it's, it's, it's pretty easy. And, you know, speaking of the notion of property, as, as we get into the Civil War and as we talk about slavery, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the slaveholders, a lot of the plantation owners, not the majority, but the big plantation owners, you know, slaves were costing, oh, I think back then, $1,500, $1,600, which in today's terms is like, you know, twenty or $30,000. So if someone had uh, 100 slaves or 50 slaves on their plantation, yeah, the human thing we can't understand, but the financial thing, that was a big investment for them. So that was one of the big problems. It was like, hey, if you're going to take out, take, take away all my slaves, you know, I need to recoup this investment. Someone's got to pay me for them, sort of like a reverse reparations type thing. So that's sort of an underlying thread that goes through all this as well. Um, so the other big point is, so we kind of talked about how uh, slave owners and, and plantation owners and Southerners wanted to expand west to um, extend their agricultural reach and to open up more land to make more money. Uh, but as they did that, what they, they ran into Native Americans. So you're going to read about the Choctaws and you're going to read about the Cherokees. And, and these are some amazing stories, especially when you re read about the Cherokees who were in northern Georgia that had this really sophisticated Western-based society with, I mean, with city officials and courts and, you know, just amazing when you read about how how much the Cherokee assimilated to, um, you know, American ways, if you will. And, uh, but, but as, as planters started to move west, they were running into these, these large Indian holdings, especially in Georgia and I think a little bit in Tennessee. Um, and so the Indians were sophisticated enough to actually go to court uh, go to the Supreme Court and say, hey, we don't have to sell our lands because there were there was talk about, you know, Georgia forcing Indians off their land and, and forcing them to take some money for their land. Well, it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court uh, twice favored uh, for the Cherokee saying that uh, the land was uh, legally the Cherokee land and that no one could take it away from them unless they wanted to sell it to somebody. And so that was held up in court uh, twice, Supreme Court. But, you know, you know what's going to happen, you know, between the state authorities and the moneyed interests, uh, they were they're going to you know come in. And maybe you've heard of the Trail of Tears, maybe you haven't. But basically, all of the Indians in the south and that is west of the Appalachian Mountains. So in the Georgia, um, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Panhandle, that area right now, all of those Indians were forced, removed uh, across the Mississippi into Oklahoma. And it was, it was devastating for them because, A, uh, they had to move off of land that was legally theirs, that the Supreme Court withheld was legally theirs. Um, and they were forcibly and violently removed from the land and had to march all the way to Oklahoma, which is a long way from Georgia, if you've ever driven it before, and I have, uh, across the Mississippi River um, and, and to get onto these reservations that were arid. I mean, if you've been to the panhandle of Oklahoma, it's, it's semi-arid. It's hard to grow anything there. So, you know, 
what happens is the, the Cherokees end up in the long run living off of government assistance, and it's a disaster. But, but uh, that's 9.2 in your book, section 9.2 on MindTap, is about Native American resistance and removal. And um, it's a story that's really difficult to come to grips with, I think, as an American, because it's like, hey, how could we do that? But it, it is what it is. So hopefully, you know, what we learn from it is uh, tolerance is okay, and uh, other people's rights are okay. You know, no one has the right to forcibly remove someone from their homeland. So that's what you can remove or, or get from it. Um, section 9.3 of the book, The Social Pyramid of the Old South, um, I think they spent a... Um, a lot of time on this stuff. Uh, sometimes, like in the yeoman farmer's part, I think they spend too much time. But um, the one thing that I think you should take away from this section, 9.3, is uh, A, how the African Methodist Episcopal, the AME Church, was a big part of the slave social life. So, you know, slaves could find redemption, find religion, and um, find a little respite from their horrendous lives at church. So the AME church formed. You still see AME churches all around the country, and that is the roots of the AME churches, and they were really important to slave culture. So uh, the other thing in the social pyramid part, uh, you'll read a little bit about black codes and, and how, uh, how blacks were discriminated against. So even freed blacks, I mean, did not have a good life during this period of time because of endemic racism. So there's that. Um, and then the uh, section 9.4 is called the planter's world. And this is the idea of the Southern culture, this distinctive Southern culture um, with um, you know, certain gender roles and you know, very paternalistic where the guys were in charge of everything, very dependent upon slaves. Um, very concerned about making sure their their daughters, you know, the debutantes got proper education and um, just a whole different world. And and over the years, there's been a lot of novels written and movies made that romanticize this lifestyle. So take the slaves out of it. I mean, these guys were living in these beautiful homes, these giant farms, and everything was perfect. I mean, the architecture is amazing. Uh, if you see any of those old Southern homes. So so uh, this was an idyllic lifestyle for the plantation owners, but obviously it wasn't a great lifestyle for the slaves. And most people in the country in the North thought that it was ridiculous. They were like, uh, you know, they were like dukes, <laughs> you know, dukes and duchesses and little kings of their own fiefdom. So um, it, it's, it's really something to read about the planter's world. And you'll be watching a movie clip this week uh, just a little tiny clip. I think it's two minutes from Gone with the Wind, which is a, a famous old movie uh, that I wrote about. And um, um, you'll see how the daughter is treated in that movie clip as this, uh, you know, girl who has everything, rich girl who has everything type of thing. Um, the other part of 9.4, the book talks about slavery and capitalism and has this whole debate about it. I think it's kind of silly. I mean, it's obvious that um, slavery, slave culture, cotton culture is all capitalist because slaves are basically tools used to make a profit on a product, which is cotton or tobacco. So I don't even know why the book talks about it. It seems obvious to me, but maybe, I don't know. Uh, the other thing you'll read about Eli Whitney and the cotton gin, which you've been reading about since high school, um, but that, you know, it's really true and it really did make a difference on cotton production because uh, it made cotton production a lot faster and therefore more profitable. So you'll read about Eli Whitney. Um, I don't like Eli Whitney much, not because of the cotton gin, but just because he um, um, he also went to Congress to propose manufacturing weapons, and he was a brilliant manufacturer, and he came up with this idea of interchangeable parts. Uh, I teach a business and technology class, actually in the spring, uh, History 3380, and we talk a lot about Eli Whitney, not as much for the cotton gin, but because he was a brilliant inventor, uh, but he was also somewhat of a scam artist too, but you'd have to take my 3380 class to learn more about that. That's a fun one. Um, so what else? Uh, so we talked about the planner's world, slave life and labor, you know, I, you can't, this, this is not a cut and dried thing. So the book talks about some slaves were treated very well by their masters. And uh, so, so that is out there and that's not that uncommon. But of course, uh, other slaves were you know, brutally beat. And uh, there's another movie clip from 12 Years a Slave that you'll watch this week that'll show some of that part, that side of it. Um, 
and and slavery is wrong. I mean, you can't own anybody. So, you know, regardless of whether the slaves were treated kindly or not treated kindly, it's still wrong and inhumane and terrible um, and and hard to believe. But just understand that the relationships between slaves and slave owners was was varied. Uh, most of the time it was cruel. A lot of families were separated. Uh, there was a lot of sexual abuse. And you'll read a lot about that in the book. Um, and whatever you read about, multiply by two. Because, you know, you absolutely know what was going on um, between white slave owners and, and their black slaves, the black slave women. So um, not, a, not a good part of the history. But, again, uh, read through it because I think it teaches us that, um, you know, the darker angel um, in all of us, I, I guess, lives somewhere. And given the right circumstances, you know, bad things can happen. So um, think a lot about that. And then finally, slave culture and resistance. Um, there's a quiz question about this. So, you know, how were slave communities built? And I don't mean like construction wise, but I mean, you know, what social things or actions bring people together. So uh, music is one, religion is one, food, rhythms, uh, stories. And I think the book does a really nice job in this section um, showing you how uh, the slaves, the only way that African Americans could survive as far as, you know, their mental well-being and have hope was to build these communities and, and create this distinct culture based on things that slave masters couldn't stop you from doing. I mean, they couldn't stop, stop you from singing or having a rhythm or, or uh, reading the Bible or practicing Christianity. And so there's a lot of personal things you can do when you're in a terrible situation uh, to get by, and that that uh, section nine point six is all about that. So there's that. Um, and then let me just go through the quiz real quick. I'm sorry, this is a little discombobulated today, but I think we're getting there. Um, all right, let me see what's on the quiz. So the quiz is uh, one of the questions is about um, what what uh, what reasons were given to justify slavery in the South. So we talked about that. So that's an easy one. That's right in the beginning of the book. Um, there's a question about the Supreme Court and Cherokee, so read that part. There's a question about, um, actually, okay. There's a question about what binds slave communities together. So that was the music story stuff, so uh, be prepared for that. And then um, there's a question, an interesting question, question four that I'm not going to tell you about. Uh, you'll have to read it, but it's a, it's a good question. It's a true or false. Sorry to do that to you, but I want you to look that one up. And then uh, you'll read a little bit about Nat Turner's rebellion, and there's a, a couple of questions. There's one question about that on the quiz. So uh, sorry this went so long. That's it for this week, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you again next week. If you have any questions, if you're having any trouble at all, please reach out to me, and I'll help you out to the extent that I can. That's it. Have a good week. Bye-bye.